All right, guys, so to really understand what we're trying to accomplish in Unit 4, um, as we talk through the age of revolution, we've got to understand where we've started. And to do that, we really have to start all the way back in Athens, um, because Athens and Rome are where we get our classical ideas about how government works, and through the Renaissance, how that's going to affect our feudal societies and those types of things as we move forward into this age of revolution and our current understanding of government. So, we're going to start with Unit 2 on Athens. And so what we find out is that in Athens, um, kind of that spot in Greece that we look for for all of our classical thought and philosophy and stuff like that, tyranny was not necessarily bad. In fact, they would ask certain tyrants to come in for a short time in order to um, maintain order in their society. So tyranny wasn't always bad, but it was a temporary construct. It wasn't anything that would maintain for a long period of time. So all the way back into Unit 2 with Athens, the um, person that we really want to pay attention to here is Cleisthenes. Cleisthenes was um, a very important political philosopher within um, Athens, and he came up with the idea that, you know, we really should vote um, about the various things that happen in our political world. Um, political, in fact, is derived from the word polis, or city-state, that we get from the Greek. The other thing that we get from Cleisthenes is this idea of democracy or demos kratian, demokratia, which means people rule, okay? Again, here's your vocabulary. It's in green. Demokratia means people rule. This is going to be important, once again, later on in Unit 4 when we talk about popular sovereignty because we want people to rule, popular, meaning people, sovereignty, meaning ruled, but they're different because of this consent of the governed piece. Um, in, under popular sovereignty in a republic, you are going to protect all kinds of people, even our minorities. Whereas in over here with democratia, or as we know it today, demo democracy, um, it actually ends up becoming tyranny of the majority. Um, not just a temporary tyranny, but a tyranny that happens over and over and over again and eventually leads to um, one person taking over and becoming kind of an authoritarian, uh, monarchical government. So that's where we're at right now. When you vote, you have choice. So you can say yes or no to many different issues and things that we need to figure out. Um, as far as what government does for us. Remember from Unit 1, the reason why we have government, organized government, was to protect the surplus. Because we couldn't do anything else without surplus. So we can't have social stratification, we can't have um, jobs other than farmer um, or hunter-gatherer without government. Um, and so now in Athens, we're saying, well, the people should have a voice and some choice in their government and how government works for them. Well, in order to make good choices, we need to talk about it. So we have debates and people talk and argue and prove their points and work through philosophy in order to understand what we're really trying to do. So we must convince others to do the same things that we're doing, to vote with us. So, how do we do that? We use philosophy. We are going to argue in a logical manner. While we use philosophy, we create the philosophy of the people, or politics. Okay, Politics is the reflection of the philosophy of the masses and how they want to be treated. Okay. Here's a major connection. We have an arrow all the way over here from Democratia 
to assembly. The assembly in Athens was specifically the citizens of Athens that would be in the assembly making decisions for the whole group. Now this is interesting because the assembly could only be made out of male citizens. Sorry girls, you have been relegated to barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. Be beautiful, keep the kids quiet and well behaved, and everybody's happy, right? Wrong. Ladies, you're important, and we figured that out in the last, you know, 100 years or so. Um, let's keep that going. So, um, unfortunately, though, women, you're not part of this deal. You don't get to be part of isonomia or popular government. So it's just the guys that get to make these kinds of decisions. Sorry. All right. So what happens then is then we will have guys, okay, that alpha male, if you remember from unit one, that get too powerful. And so what we would do is we would ostracize them. Okay? And the way they would do this in Greece is they would have shards of pottery and people would scratch somebody's name on it and they would drop it in a big pot and they would vote someone off the island, essentially, um, that was too powerful. And this was a way that they were able to provide checks and balances, really important governmental concept, so that somebody doesn't get too powerful, okay, and become a tyrant. Um, not just a temporary tyrant, like we started with in Athens, but a tyrant for their lifetime. So, looky here, we've got red. We're arrowing over to the next concept. So, we've just finished concept one, how we figure out government in Athens, all the way over to concept two. How does this work in our feudal empire? So, remember, feudal empire is actually unit three, all right? This is where we're trying to understand things through the Renaissance, okay? Remember, in the Renaissance, we had two major institutions. We have the secular institution and we have the church. So, what we're dealing with right here is a little bit of both, all right? The feudal empire's secular institution is created by the church, all right? This is held under this idea of the divine right of kings, okay? Divine meaning God, okay? So how we remember this is God made me king, so I can do anything. And that is a very interesting concept, and it's going to get our kings in trouble later on. So when God made me king so I can do anything, the king tells the people what to do because he's the guy that God set over them, the alpha male, that will end up protecting their lives and their liberty and their property. Wait a second, that sounds like natural rights. Remember that. Um, then you don't have a choice. You just have to do what he says. That's unfortunate. But if you remember back to our pyramid of society in um, unit three. The serfs are at the bottom, and they have to do what they're told to do. Why? Because if they don't, they don't go to heaven. And their life is already hellish enough. They need to go to heaven, so they're going to do what they're told, even though that means they don't have a choice anymore. That's going to be a change. So what it means is now we have a disconnect. Nobody's thinking anymore. Over here in Athens, it was all about thinking. We're thinking, we're debating, we're talking, we're going through philosophy and politics and making arguments so that people understand what's trying to happen. But here in the feudal empire, remember, we have been away from our classical stuff for a while. And those crusades are starting to bring it back into that renaissance and we're gonna have that rebirth, but we're not there yet. So since we haven't had that rebirth of thinking and working through what things mean and how they affect us, we're not allowed to think yet. So it's very much a do or you die culture. If you conform, that's good for everybody, especially the king. 